Hi. In this lecture, what I want to talk about is what happens when two liquids are mixed together. We're going to first need to discuss the language of miscibility, which is how well they mix, and then also talk about triangle diagrams and the lever principle, because that's going to be an important way for solving some separations problems that we will be looking at in the future. So first, equilibrium between liquid phases. If the two liquid phases actually blend together to form one homogeneous liquid phase, so much as it would if you were to mix, say, uh, water with an alcohol, okay, that's called being miscible. They mix. So mixable, miscible is the formal word for it. If they don't blend at all, so like water and oil, then they're going to be immiscible, that I am meaning it's not mixable. So just they're going to totally separate out. You shake them up and they just go right back apart. And then we have those ones where they partially blend. So a lot of things, if I add just a little bit of a particular liquid, it'll mix in. But the more I add, the two phases separate out. So these are the systems that really are going to be of interest to us. Um, if I were to add to the immiscible or partially miscible solutions a third component, it will distribute itself between those two phases. So sometimes it will be very prevalent in, say, the water or the aqueous phase, and sometimes it will be much more prevalent in the oil-rich phase. But we're going to talk about how something like this can be distributed across such a system. So the idea of liquid-liquid extraction is that I have a mixture of A and B that are together, and I really want the B out of there. I want pure A because I can sell pure A. Okay, so if I can find the right chemical C and add C to this mixture and shake it really well and let it come to equilibrium, if the B is more soluble in C, then it will preferentially go to that C layer. And then I can just decant that off and I'm left with virtually pure material A. And there are many, many systems that I can purify using techniques such as this. Now, most of these systems are going to focus on three components. So we're going to be wanting to look at ways of representing the data that describes how well chemical B distributes between A and C. So with three chemicals, creating a single graph is a little tricky, so what is traditionally used is these triangle diagrams. Now these triangle diagrams are um, a little bit challenging to read, but it is something that as a chemical engineer you do need to learn how to do. So I'm going to ask you to take it upon yourself to really try to read and make sure you can read these points. So there's good instruction in the textbook. The videos by Learn Chemi are going to also be very helpful for this. We will work on it some in class, but you need to come into class with a good basic understanding of what on earth this crazy graph is doing. So first of all, in the corners, they usually tell you the name of a chemical. That name goes in the corner that represents 100% acetone up here. Water down here, or MIBK, methyl isobutyl ketone, down in this corner. This line connecting acetone and MIBK represents the binary mixture of MIBK and acetone. This one is acetone plus water, and this is water plus MIBK. If I have no acetone and only mixtures of water and MIBK, okay, every point in between here is going to be a combination of those somehow. And so I'm going to take and read a point here. So point K that's listed here is, I can read these numbers down, it's 65% acetone. And it's, let's see, this is where I have no water, so 5, 10, 15% water, and 
5, 10, 15, 20 percent MIBK. And those hopefully add up to 100 percent. If they don't, it's my problem with reading the graph uh, because every point on the graph does indeed add up to 100 percent. So all these little extra features that are added to the graph, all those crazy lines at an angle in a dome, are there because they're representing the phase equilibrium. So this part out here is representing a single liquid phase. This part under the dome here is representing two liquid phases. Anything that's fed in this ratio, if I said that I had 10% um, acetone, and it just doesn't really much matter, but I was somewhere in here, okay, what's going to happen is I may put it in in those ratios, but it's not going to stay like that. It's going to switch to two liquid phases, okay? Those phases will separate out. And so I'm going to have two phases, and the tie lines across there are going to tell me what those compositions are. So here, just so that you can have a chance, you know, pause the video and make sure that when you see this point right here, that you can tell that that's 60% acetone, 10% water, and 30% MIBK. Now let's look at one in the two-phase region. This point right here is on a tie line. The tie line tells me the compositions of the two phases. This phase over here is about 5% water, 65% MIBK, and then the remainder is acetone. This point over here is about uh, 81% maybe, yeah, um, water and 16% acetone, about 3% MIBK. So I feed something here and it splits to these two over here. Now I can tell how much is in each phase using the lever rule. We're going to be working on this more in the next lecture, but I would like you to read this in the book so that you can get a sense of understanding that. It's going to be a way of doing material balances on systems that split into two phases. Now there's one last topic that I want to cover, and that's going to be adsorption on solid surfaces. And this is fairly quick. Um, Adsorption is what happens when a liquid or gas wants to stick to the solid. It's not going to stay in the liquid phase or the gas phase. It's going to stick to the solid. Okay? We use this when we put baking soda in a refrigerator to absorb odors out of the air. Or in my aquarium, I put activated carbon in there to absorb ammonia and all the organic waste so that the little fishies are happy. Now the word is adsorption, not absorption, okay? There's not a B in here. So adsorption is when a substance adheres to a surface, okay? So the concentration of the fluid is all on the surface and it's not inside the stuff, okay? Absorption, the fluid is dissolved into a liquid or it can be a solid, but the fluid is changing whatever it's dissolved into, and it's dispersed throughout. Okay? Now we're going to have a couple of vocabulary words here that are a little unusual to you probably. Um, if you're doing adsorption, that solid surface is the adsorbent. It does the adsorbing. And the fluid that is sticking to that surface is the adsorbate. Usually, what we're going to do is need to know what is going to how this changes with various temperatures. And so a lot of times we say, well, let's look at a fixed temperature and then see how much adsorbate I can adsorb, okay, on a particular surface surface. So in this particular case, what they've done is they've taken carbon tetrachloride and they're adsorbing it onto at activated carbon and they fixed the temperature. So at a fixed temperature that's an isotherm. So iso means constant or same therm temperature. And so they're going to hold the temperature constant and in this case they're going to change the pressure. And as they change the pressure from a vacuum to 
you know, higher pressures, then the amount of X that sticks to the surface is going to increase, but you'll notice it trails off up here. Okay, So it's not a linear relationship. A lot of times what people have found is that the curves tend to have this sort of a shape to them. They level off after a certain time. And so Langmuir developed a, an equation and a way of describing this. And so a lot of times we'll use a Langmuir isotherm to describe adsorption onto a surface. And it can be done in terms of partial pressures or in terms of compositions. And you need data such as this so that you can find out what those constants are equal to in this various drawing. Um, it just becomes a matter of fitting the curve to this style of equation and solving for k. For this course, just being aware of adsorption as a process and knowing that the Langmuir isotherm exists is all that's going to really be required of you at this point in time, but it is going to be very significant when you move into studying uh, reactors and kinetics. So again, make sure that you can read numbers off of those triangle diagrams, and we will come back to class uh, on Thursday.